I thought somebody's actually impersonating him, but after we sort of got over that, um, I got to his office. In two weeks, he ran me throughout the entire political body in Israel, the entire industrialist collection of Israel. And at the last day of the two weeks time, the Prime Minister of Israel, Prime Minister Ulmer, um, told me, I've heard from all my ministers that you met with them. I got to talk to you. Paris brought me in. And we started talking about this. And he said, well, if you need $200 million to build this network, don't come asking me. We're, we're a government. We're not a venture capitalist. So find your money somewhere else. And find me a car company that will build this car in millions, not in tens. And a serious car company, one of the top five in the world. I don't take anybody who's smaller than that. And if you find a car company and you find the $200 million, I'll give you a place where you can actually spend the money and build it here. I went to Paris. He thought it was a great idea. He thought it was a fair deal. And I said, you know what? Actually, it is a fair deal. Israel committed to making it a national project if we find the money if we found the car company. We approached multiple car companies. Paris and myself actually met with Carlos Ghosn, CEO of Renault and Nissan. And after about five minutes, he told us, I have your car. I have your battery. I'll be your partner. And we started a wonderful journey together. I drove the car, the actual car that went through the entire supply chain of all the companies that make the components of that car and then got assembled about three weeks ago. And she's a beauty. It drives beautifully. It's fast. It's everything that Carl is going committed. The car will be demonstrated in two months' time at the Frankfurt Auto Show, and it will change the world. It'll be the first mass-produced, zero emission, no oil, no gasoline, no petrol car, no tailpipe, to be produced in hundreds of thousands of cars. Not in a hundred or a thousand, but in hundreds of thousands of cars. We're building the network in Israel. There are about a thousand spots like this already in the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and Haifa. Everywhere you go, you'll find them. They're actually active. So if you have an electric car, come plug in. Um, it will work. Um, we've got permits with all the cities. We've argued through all the municipal levels. We've done all these things. And then magic happened. When Israel did this, other politicians said, you know, if the Israelis can do it, we can do it too. Denmark decided to go do this as well. And we sort of gotten into this stigma of better place can do small countries. So we figured out we got to stop that. And we came in here last year. We figured out if we do Australia, nobody ever says we can only do small countries anymore. <laughs> Ends up that Australia is kind of an unfair battle. Don't tell anybody. but. We picked an unfair location. Australia is six transportation islands connected with arteries between them. Each one of those transportation islands is a classic island for a better place. It's sprawling, long drive, two-car garage, in and out, with people who actually want this transformation to happen. Each one of these islands will get electric, and the freeways, the roads will get electric. And the cost of the roads, even though they're long on the map, is tiny in comparison. To do 1,600 kilometers worth of road, you need 40 stations, switch stations, which is $20 million. The length of the road almost doesn't matter to the cost of the project. So Australia will be a great example because everybody thinks it's impossible to do. And when it's done, it makes everything else possible. Sure enough, it woke up the Americans, and suddenly we got asked, well, if you can do Australia, why can't you do the west coast of the United States? It's just like it. <laughs> we figured out why not. Canadians woke up. Now every country is awake. And now we're basically at a situation where we're picking up where we want to go, because we have a limitation of how many countries we can do. Even with a bunch of crazy Israelis, it is hard to take on the entire world in one year. It's a fantastic project. It's on target. And when it's done, it will show that we can actually tackle a problem of immense magnitude, a billion tailpipes, with ingenuity of very, very few people, 170 people right now, 400 more co contractors around those 170 people, with speed unprecedented, but with profit. 
For every ton of CO2 that we will save, we will make $250 million macroeconomic profit for the countries that take on this project. I didn't say we will cost $250. We will make $250 for every ton of CO2. It's the most profitable ton of CO2 to take out of the atmosphere. And there are a lot of it. There are great projects just like that. If we're willing to take the full step and go all the way, just like we're going to create cars that are not halfway there or 20% there, but absolutely abolish petrol, we'll make light bulbs without incandescent material inside, where not 90% goes into heat, but 0% goes into heat. We'll make cement without CO2. We will make cities that will be absolutely zero carbon footprint, not because we want to save carbon, but because we want to save money. And in the process, there will be four or five or six companies that will be viewed as if they were obscenely rich because they got there first. And lots of other companies that will copy the model and compete in the market. And that's what we want to create. We want to create lots of other places. They won't be better, but there'll be other places. They'll be almost good and virtually good, and we almost did it. And some of them will be great places. And with that competition, we'll change the world. We have to do it because usually the toughest decisions to take are the best ones. I'll give you one example, which I got from Bobby Kennedy Jr., one of my idols, he told me this great story about the British Parliament about 200 years ago discussed the issue of slavery and the issue of morality in slavery and said, we cannot continue to be immoral. We cannot continue to own human spirits in order to help our economy. And the debate went on for almost a month on what ways do you disengage from slavery. Some people said, let's do it slowly, sort of like 17% reduction by 2020. <laughs> and their way to do it was to say, if a kid is born to a slave, they'll be free, but the slaves we have right now will continue to be slaves. If we've admitted, we'll continue. But if you build new, China, build clean. And at the end of it, they basically came back and said, well, even though we don't understand what's the economic impact of the decision, we will free all the slaves, other than the colonies, obviously. And within a year, the Industrial Revolution happened. What you do to replace cheap labor is no labor. And a full century of economic prosperity came as a result of a, of a moral decision. Now we have a moral decision to make. Do we want to destroy the planet before our kids get to enjoy it? Or do we want to make the right moral decision? And I guarantee you, we make the right moral decision, we get a great economy. We make an immoral decision, we will lose our economy within days of losing our morality. That's the choice we have today. We need your help to make this happen as much as you can do. Thank you very much.